Hello everyone and welcome to my YouTube channel, Le Labo de J. This is the third and last part of my series devoted to HDR. So hang on, it's going to be a huge video, about half an hour. It will be available in long version, and you will find it on separate modules on the channel. We will talk again about display, color science, dynamic range, compression and subsampling, size of the image, we will analyze contents from Blu-ray 4K HDR, and we will make an HDR content. This content will be available on my website, www.lelabodj.com. You will be able to download it in SDR, HDR10, HDR10+, Dolby Vision, HLG, and Technicolor SLHDR1 and 2. You will be super spoiled, but first, jingle intro. Hello everyone, I'm very pleased to meet you again. Before starting, I would like to treat two or three things. First thing, there will be product placement. For this HDR sequence, some equipment were loaned to me. And this equipment, I will showcase it, so don't be surprised. At one point, we will talk about products and there will be product placement. Second thing, same line, I will mention people who helped me a lot for the creation of this sequence. So don't be surprised, there will be things for everyone. And third thing, in the previous video, some errors were made that I will correct here and there, so don't be surprised. At some point, we will see again some things we talk about in part 1 and 2, and I will make some small adjustments. Well, I'm not perfect, some mistakes script, these are extremely complex subjects to talk about. I went a little fast and I ask you to forgive me, and we will try to fix it all. And now, let's do it. So, we are going to do a small display workshop. I will take the opportunity to fix a small mistake that I repeated several times in part 1 and 2. I was using the term broadcaster wrongly. A broadcaster is not a TV set or a computer or a smartphone, a broadcaster is still of one canal plus. It's someone who will provide you content. To display an HDR content, you obviously need a compatible display set. To be compatible, this display set needs to recognize two very important information. These informations will follow you everywhere. It's the color volume and the transfer curve. It will characterize the signal. An HDR signal is BT2020 for the color volume and PQ for the transfer curve. PQ if it's HDR10, 10, 10 plus, Dolby Vision or SLHDR2. Or it can be HLG. We will focus on PQ because this is the content you will see the more often on Netflix, your Blu-rays, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, etc. The content you're watching in HDR is in PQ. Because the HDR10, 10, 10 Plus, Dolby Vision and SLHDR2, they are all based on HDR10. What will change is the management of the metadata, if they are static or dynamic. So your display device has to recognize the color volume and the transfer curve. If it's not the case, your image won't be displayed correctly. You probably already face that kind of case, when you have an image like this one, a bit milky, not contrasted. It's because the color volume or the transfer curve is not recognized. It's useless to fight with a remote control to adjust saturation, contrast, or whatever. It's just because the image is not decoded correctly. Here you can see I'm on the TV menu. We have access to some settings. It's asking in which transfer curve it has to display this image. And according to my choice, you will see the image will be decoded correctly or not. If you want to display an HDR content on a display set that is not compatible, that is to say an SDR display set, you don't have 50 solutions, you have to do some tone mapping. You will transform your content to adapt it to the display characteristics of your display device. In this case, you will transform the color volume and the transfer curve in the color volume and transfer curve wished. That is to say that you will pass from BT2020 to Rec709 and from PQ to Gamma 2.4. The tone mapping can be managed by some of your devices able to do it able to convert HDR in SDR. It can be done by external device like Lumagen Box or by a software like MatVR. Why do I tell this? Because later I will show you HDR 4K content that I will compare to SDR Blu-ray. To do that, I don't have other solution that to convert my HDR. HDR and SDR don't go together. It's two different color spaces, two different ways of coding, and it is displayed totally differently. So if you want to compare some HDR with SDR, 
I have to convert my HDR. There is no other solution. Or I should convert my SDR in HDR and make an HDR video. But this video is not HDR. It's YouTube, it's 8-bit. So I put everything in the same color space to be able to make comparison. Obviously, by doing that, my HDR content is not as precise as if you were watching it on a HDR display set. It's obvious, but for the tone mapping I will do, I will use the Dolby Vision tools. Dolby Vision tone mapping is formidable. The color mapping and the highlight mapping is highly accurate. It will be less qualitative than if you watch this signal from a real HDR display set but it will give you a good idea of the difference between those two signals. I would like to take some time to talk about something we didn't discuss. It's the color science. The color management. You must know that each camera, each maker, each manufacturer has its own color science. A red would have its own color volume and transfer curve. Same for Alexa, same for Sony, same for Blackmagic. If you have a project that uses several different cameras and you have to mix those footage and mix them, it can get complicated because all these sources don't necessarily go along and you have to find a color space and color management that runs all of that. So as color management, color science, today you can find several. Among the most widespread, the one we try to get really popular is ACES. Basically, it collects the information from the camera it takes out every information that are specific to each camera and it applies what we call a IDT, stands for Input Data Transform, which removes all the specific features of the camera and converts in a color space standardized by ACES. You have to know that the DCI P3, the REC709 and the VT2020 are color spaces for display. But the color spaces for the camera, like RED or Alexa, they are way bigger. So the aim of the game is to recover and keep the information from this camera. So far, we need to create a way bigger color space, so it can take all the existing color spaces, in a way that to have no loss of information. In addition to that, we'll use a base for the export. A file where we can call all of that, so that we have no loss and store a maximum of data. So we won't be in 8 bits or even in 10 bits, we will be in 16 bits floating point. To explain simply the way we were doing this before, we had some footage recorded by RED or Alexa, for example, we would apply a lot to bring everything in the color space we want for the grading. For example, if you want to color grade in DCI-P3, we will make a lot to convert the color volume from Alexa to P3. The color volume from the red camera, it will convert it in P3. So it will convert everything to color grade in P3. But the problem is that it limits my color grading to my output format. With the ACES, it would be different. It will collect the footage from different manufacturers, take out all the specific properties of each manufacturer and bring everything in a universal color space, the ACES color space. I will do the color grading in ACES and after that I will apply a transformation according to my output system. So I'll do an ODT, stands for Output Device Transform, in REC709 if I want REC709. I'll do an ODT in BT2020 if I want BT20. Overall, my master will be in ACES and it will be saved in ACES. We'll try to linearize the workflow to the maximum we'll try to get rid of all of that is transfer curve too. Have a curve that's the most linear possible. As if it wasn't complicated enough, there are several LCs. There are ACs CC, the CCT, the AP0, which is strictly linear, because the CC and the CCT are more or less on a logarithmic base on their way to treat the signal, but overall the aim of the ACs is to get as close as possible to a linear signal, a riddle of any gamma curve. I didn't trap you, I told you this video will be technical and you could get an headache. And even trust me, I remain superficial. Let's do a small dynamic range workshop. As a reminder, the dynamic range is the gap between the brightest and the darkest value of the image. 
The biggest is the gap, the more dynamic is your image. Dynamic range is measured in stop or light intensity. An image with a standard dynamic range is in average of 7 stops. Above 10 stops, it's considered as HDR. I remind you that the dynamic range is defined at the shooting. It's when we record the signal, it's the camera sensor that has a large dynamic range. For a display device, we are talking about contrast ratio for the difference between the highest value and the darkest value. So to illustrate this, I went filming with my Nikon Z6, which has a dynamic range of 12 stops. It's not huge, but it's more than enough to do HDR. I put myself in three standard shooting configurations. I recorded in Rec. 709, Logarithmic and RAW. As a reminder, Rec. 709 is the standard dynamic range. When you record the image, it's ready to be displayed on the HDTV set. I film in logarithmic, which allows me in post-production to do color grading. I will be able to output an image either in Rec. 709, either in HDR or whatever I want. It's an image a bit milky, where I'm going to have information in highlights and lowlights. And I film in RAW, it's like a digital negative. This file will be developed in post-production. We can modify several settings, you have as many RAW as you have camera manufacturer. You have a color space and UOTF associated to each camera. You can modify these parameters. You can change the color space or UOTF if needed. You have a huge latitude with RAW. In contrary of what I said in first part, you have compression on this file. You can choose the level of compression on set. Then when developing file in post, you can export file without compression. But keep in mind that file is compressed at start. So the little nuance is that there, it's the Apple RAW. Apple ProRes RAW. It's a role which is not as developed as what you can find on a RED, a Blackmagic, a Sony or an Alexa camera. It's a simplified role, but despite that, it's a signal which is way stronger than logarithmic image or Rec. 709. Obviously, who says ProRes RAW also says other limitation. It's not compatible with every software, and all my workflow is based on DaVinci Resolve, which is not compatible with ProRes RAW. So we are going to use a small trick and go in Assimilated Scratch, another color grading software. Which, by the way, is really good since I'll be able to import my ProRes RAW, my Rec. 709 and my logarithmic image. And now I'm going to give you some headache. I've got three monitors behind me. There's one which will disappear and be replaced by the ASUS monitor, the grading screen. All my workflow is organized on DaVinci Resolve. So the SDR sequence I will calibrate will be generated in Dolby Vision. For the Dolby Vision, I need two screens, one SDR and one HDR. So there will be the ASUS monitor for calibrating, and next there is a SDR monitor. But my friend Scratch, who recognizes Apple ProRes, does not recognize to display. The middle screen you will see looks a little purplish. It's because it doesn't receive the signal correctly. Don't be surprised. The picture you will see will be a little purplish, it's normal. We don't care about the screen in the middle. Second thing, the screen here is my GUI, my graphical user interface, the one on which I will make my settings. I will do a video screen capture, but this capture will be in Rec. 709, not in HDR. So the picture that will be displayed on this screen doesn't match the reality. Because this image is made to be displayed on a HDR screen. Again, it's always the same problem. HDR and SDR are not displayed the same way. What you will see on capture screen is not the reality. The reality is behind me on this HDR ASUS monitor. Here we are on the same configuration I showed you before. It may be different software, but it works the same way. We have the image and we give it the color volume and the associated AOTF curve. Here we have an image that has been shot in Rec. 709 with a Gamma 2.4. There you have its little friend which is in BT2020 with the Nikon log. And there you have the Apple ProRes version. It displays a little differently because it's linear. So here we'll debayerize the image. I will debayerize it in Rec2020 and apply the Nikon log. I end up with two logarithmic images, but you will see that there is one that offers a lot more information than the other. Because it's been recorded differently and it's been coded differently and mostly one is in 12 bits. So here you can see I have my Nikon log from my ProRes RAW and here is the native Nikon log I recorded with the camera. I assume we can say it's totally different. I specify that these images are exposed the same way. Between my Rec. 709, my log and my RAW, I have not changed any camera settings. 
it's exactly the same thing. It's just the way to record it that is different. We can see that there is a lot of details in this picture in ProRes RAW. In the log, it seems way darker, but we can see some details. Of course, these images are not yet color graded. And here in the Rex 79, we can say that we don't see any details. I can try to bring back some information in this image, but you can see that it became very milky. And you can notice that I don't have the information. The information haven't been recorded. Restricted dynamic range. I have no information in the black. I have no information in the highlights. Well, it's not particularly noticeable in the highlights, but I recorded another sample where it's more visible. But there, we don't have the information in the black. In the log, we have a bit more. It's not crazy, but we can see some small things here and there, and we have some details. But here, in my log from ProRes, I have way more information. From my ProRes row, I'll be able to make a lock, a Rec 709. From that, I can output some HDR. Same from my log, I can output an HDR image. Even if it's not perfectly exposed, I'll be able to make an HDR image. From that, I have an image that on my HDR screen is frankly superb. There are highlights, some darker area, nice color. So here is what you can obtain from a raw file. Let's look at another example. It's the same ProRes file, I develop it in REC 2020 and associate to Nikon Log Curve. So here I'm set in logarithmic, I put my direct camera facing the sun. So in terms of art exercise for the camera, we are not bad. And I film the same scene in REC 709. I'm looking at this image, and what do I have? Well, I have something all milky, flat, drooling, the saturation of my skies is really weird, and I almost have no information in my black. I won't be able to do a lot of things with this picture. If I try to lower the highlights, it becomes greyish as you can see. I don't bring details in the sun. If I try to boost the low lights, do I bring some details down here? A bit, but it becomes milky. So I will have to contrast, but then it will get darker, logic. But if I go back on my ProRes image, you don't see it, but I recover a lot of small details here. A lot of little colored stains due to the lens flare because the sun directly facing the lens. I have texture in the highlights and the lowlights. If I boost the black, I can recover some extra texture in the leaves. If I increase the saturation, I get a beautiful sky. Now I have an image type postcard. Here the dynamic range is huge because I have a very high light intensity and in the dark area I can see still the leaves. Don't forget, you get the dynamic range at the shooting. Once again, it's not something you can fix in post. It depends on how you record the signal. If you have no info on shooting, you won't have more in post-production. Now I will show you some terrible pictures. I shot my Terminator in front of a window in Rec. 79 8 bits and you will see it's pretty interesting because it's totally overexposed. But what interests me in this image, it's the background. As you can see here, there is a blurry gradient absolutely ugly. Really ugly. Same near the window, it's absolutely ugly. I could have done better in the shooting, but that's not what I wanted. What I want to show you, it's the bending. In 8 bits, you only have 256 shades. Here from example, from blue to black, we'll have 256 shades of blue. And we can see that it's not sufficient to make a high quality gradient. You see the leaf here? It's really roughly cut. Between the blur and the leaf, it's really not pretty. And here it's the same at the edge of the roof. You have a straight line and some mess. I'd specify that the two images are saved in Apple ProRes 422HQ. So it's the same compression. There's no trick like one image is more compressed than the other. It's the same thing. I have a logarithmic image in 10 bits and another in a Rec. 79 8 bits. But they are compressed the same way. So here you can see that the logarithmic 10 bits has way better management of the blur. Here the shoulder is not built like in Rec. 709. Here the sky in the background has no detail. We cannot see any clouds, it's flattened. But here, on my logarithmic, we see some little things. Little thing that I didn't mention, but also I didn't get into a color grading tutorial. When you have a logarithmic image, if you want to display it on a Rec. 709 screen, you have to apply a LUT, a lookup table. It's a file which converts the logarithmic to Rec. 709. 
it can convert in Rec 709 or in whatever you want. We do what we want with the LUT. Therefore, you have files that will allow you to display this image and get closer to something like that. Between an image recorded in Rec 709 and an image recorded in Logarithm, then converted in Rec 709, we have a better quality, theoretically, if the LUT is well done. Actually, I don't like this process so much. First of all, because we don't necessarily have the control of it, and there is more or less qualitative LUT, and it can distort the signal. But the main problem with using a LUT, if you apply your LUT from log to Rec 709, I will be stuck in Rec 709. My file will be limited to Rec 709, and that's not what I want to do. For my logarithmic, I want to do some color grading and make some HDR. So by applying a LUT in Rec 709, I'm stuck. HDR is over. Here I'm going to color grade my file a bit. And here you go. Here I have something not too bad, and you can see there is a huge difference between this image and the image from the Rec 709. I have way more information in my picture. With this little workshop, I showed you broadly how do we produce an HDR content from an image recorded in RAW or in LOG. You need information because to make some HDR image, you'll need a maximum of information. The strict minimum is to do it from a 10-bit logarithmic image. What I also showed you is to make an HDR content. It's not an effect you apply in post-production. It's that we do a color grading of the image in a particular ecosystem. Instead of being in Rec 709 Gamma 2.4, we are in BT2020 and ST2044. I will display on this screen. I will do the setting in my software so that my output image will be in the color volume BT2020 and ST2044. It's a bigger color volume that you have in SDR. Upon a reroll, I will have an image which will be correctly displayed on HDR screen and I'll have a lot of leeway. But obviously, as you could see on a SDR screen, it's not displayed correctly at all. Why? Because again, the color volumes and curves that are totally different. And if I want to display this image correctly on a SDR screen, I have to do tone mapping. We are going to do a little workshop of compression and comparison of image chroma subsampled in 420 and 444, etc. We we'll start from this image shot with the red. We are with the raw file and I'm going to debugorize it in flame. I can develop it in full or in half, 2560 by 1080, or stay in full in 5K. Here I have the possibility to do the debugging in 16 or 12 bits. Here I choose the color science, you know color science. Here I am in IPP2, color science from red, and we are in red white gamut log 3 gtm But let's make it simple for this workshop. We are not going to do HDR, but Rec 709, because to really compare the compression, we will use identical image. Otherwise, it's absolutely useless. Here, as usual, we choose the color volume and the EOTF curve. So here I have my Rec 709 correctly displayed on my three screens. And by the way, they're all calibrated the same way, it's a wonder. Thanks to Julien Berry. So here you can see that I have access to a lot of small settings. I can change the exposition, the ISO, put more or less light. I can change the white balance, warmer or colder. If you did mistake during the shooting, there are some things you can fix. With the RAW, it's very practical. The only thing you cannot fix for now if it's your image is blurry. If it's blurry, it's over. Or if it's very underexposed or very overexposed. Sadly, there are no miracles. But if you are in between, you have a lot of leeway to do what you want. I will skip the intermediate steps because there are few of them. Broadly here, I have my original image in 4K RAW developed in Rec 7 Mac. From that, I made an image sequence in 4K UHD 30A30 by 2160 in 16 bits in TIFF. So here, there is no compression. It's the best quality I can have. I made another version in 1980-1080 8-bit H264. And I have another version in HEVC 10-bit 4K UHD. It's the equivalent of what you have on a Blu-ray 4K HDR, except that it's not HDR because I made it in Rec 709. The small trick is that Flame doesn't recognize HEVC, so I made a DPX file from the HEVC to import it in Flame. But overall, it's the same. 
I precise that the compression were made on DaVinci Resolve. To be totally honest with you, the compression you find on your Brule, they are made by powerful computer with specialized software that can make better results than what can I have with DaVinci Resolve. We will put ourselves in a 4K configuration, so we'll have to upscale our 1080p version in 4K. Here you can see the image in 1080p. I switch it in 4K. It's using only a quarter of the size of the window. So I set it in letterbox to fill in. I add some small text to know what we are looking at. I add some here too because we'll be navigating in the picture. I write the source in 16 bits in 444 and here is the HVC in 10 bits in 420. We'll then enter this module and here we will be able to switch from an image to another. I will upload this image for you because obviously we are looking at this on YouTube video compressed in 8 bits. So I'm doing a tuto about compression with a video that is already compressed. It's a bit far-fetched, I admit. But I'll upload the native image so you will be able to take a look at it. Here I'm looking at the image at almost 50 cm of the screen. This one is a 24 inch screen and this one is a 32 screen. What can I see? If I look at the first image, the source, it displays RGB 444 16 bits. It's pretty, I have no problem. Now let's have a look at the HVC version. Here I switch from the image in 444 to 420, 16 bits to 10 bits. From where I am, I can see clearly no differences. Now let's look at the picture in H264 so we can pair the 16 bits with the Blu-ray. From where I am, I don't see any difference between these three sources. 8 bits, 10 bits, 444, 420, I don't see any difference with my bare eyes. Of course, if I stuck the image, I get very close to the screen. Or if I zoom in the image, I will see some differences. Let's get into the image, we are going to take a closer look. I look at Blu-ray HD 8 bits, 420, and I'm going to compare it with the H265, and here, yes, I see differences. Here, yes, I see difference. It's very clear, I have much less detail in the H264, I lost information. The image is less defined than the HVC. But I have zoomed at 360%. My nose is glued to the screen. This is not how we are supposed to look at the picture. Where it really shows, it's in the sky. We feel the compression. Because, once again, it's zoomed. We can see the compression here. When I look at 200%, I see something happening. I'm going to do a small trick. I'll boost the signal. I will contrast it, and here you see that there are some smuts. It's a rushly setting. But what I mean is that if you start to tweak your image, to boost contrast, to increase the saturation, you will see flows appearing into the pictures. Necessarily, on your signal in 8 bits, there is no miracle. While if I do the same setting on the HVC in 10 bits, you see the spots in the sky. I'm not even sure you can see it in the 8 bit version of YouTube. But but there, look at the color gradient, the bending. If I now compare the 16-bit version with the 10-bit version, the source with the HVC at 350%, I'm sorry, but you almost cannot feel the difference, like a real bit. My nose is glued to the screen. I'm zoomed at 350% and I almost don't see any difference. The original RAW file is 1.6 giga for a 5K image with all information. Once I develop it, I debayer it, and I save without compression, and do a 16 bit seconds in TIFF with no compression, it weight 15 gigas. My 1080p version in H.264 is 23 mega. 
and the HVC version in 4K is 40 MB. So you remember 40 MB, 15 GB. With the bare eyes, it's not visible. Once again, it's some sampling and compression for display, not to work on. Let's agree on that, don't jump to conclusion, it's for display only. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's take a tool called the keyer. It selects color, we use it to make green screen extraction. Here I select the blue and you'll see that depending on the source, it reacts completely differently. So I am selecting my image, selecting the color in the sky. I select the sky and you can see the selection is very thin, very precise. I can differentiate the kind of mist we have here. You see here I managed to differentiate the outline of the cloud. I'm doing that on the TIFF 16-bit sequence. Let's do the same on the HVC. I'm selecting the color and you can see that's not the same thing. On the 16 bits, first of all, it's 444. There is no compression. Here it's 420 and there is some sampling. It took off the most of color information. You can see there is stuff going on. You see that it reacts not very cleanly. You see the compression and and it's much less precise in the cutout of the signal. But it's not that bad. We can also do things with that, even if you see some squares. Now let's do the same exercise with the 8-bit H.264 version. Whoa. It speaks for itself. This is the degree of precision that you have in 8-bit H.264. If I separate the channels, red, green and blue, you can clearly see the 8-bit compression. Here on the 444 16-bit, it doesn't react the same way. Here on the HVC, we see that we lost a bit of sharpness and precision. We can see a great difference between the 16-bit version and the 8-bit version. We can see the blocks. With this little workshop, I wanted to show you that even if we have different subsampling system, different compressions, on the same image, just with different compressions, visually we will not necessarily realize it. And when I say that, you have to take into consideration that we look at this as a normal way, at a reasonable distance of the screen. Obviously, if you start to stick your head in the screen, you will see the difference. But if you don't niptic, if you look at the way it should be looked at, there is no reason for you to feel the difference. We are going to watch some content from Blu-ray 4K HDR, which I will compare to their SDR version. Like I said before, this content's 4K HDR will be tone mapped. This is the only way to compare them and show them properly on YouTube. At the same time, I analyze this content with the tools provided by Florian Friedrich from FF Pictures. These are software and plugins from DaVinci Resolve and you also have an independent software. This will allow me to analyze the color volume, the max fall and the max CLR. You will see these tools are really well done. It allows me to have a lot of video signal information. I'm just going to put this right. I analyze this content with tools. So it's not a subjective impression, it's not, it's not my opinion, it's not subjective, it's the oscillo, and the oscillo doesn't lie. Because you know this content, you watch them at home. But your TVs, as long as they are not properly calibrated, and your HDR settings are bad, the image that is displayed may not be the right one. What I'm going to show you may not match, you may not recognize it. But once again, the oscillo doesn't lie. The signal that is analyzed is the one that comes straight out of the Blu-ray. There is no treatment on it, and when I import it, when I digitalize, I disable all the extra treatment of the Blu-ray, so it's pure. 
Second disclaimer, you will hear me say at certain times, this, yes, this is 4K HDR content, is really good, but the color palette could totally be a SDR color volume. Let's agree on that. An HDR color and a SDR color are not coded the same way. The color volumes are different. Now, when we look at this shame, this diagram, the representation of the color space, and we will come back on it later, a fuchsia which is included here in this value, in this Rec709 triangle, the P3 includes the Rec709. We agree on that. So if you have a color that exceeds Rec709 and which are in the triangle of P3, you take advantage of the HDR color palette. But if you stay in the colors included in the Rec709, it just means that you don't necessarily take advantage of all that the HDR can offer. Now the small nuance, we must take into consideration that we have a 3D volume. We have the color, but also the luminance that is more important in HDR. But let's be clear, a fuchsia in Rec709 will also be a fuchsia in P3 or BT2020. Once again, if your screen is correctly calibrated in SDR and in HDR, you shouldn't see any difference. What I mean here is that sometimes I will be saying that we have a color volume which doesn't use more than the Rec709. It's nothing pejorative. It's just artistically, they didn't have the need to push further. So, as simple as that, nothing mean. To make it short, this is what we call an isogram. It represents the signal in NIT. It goes down to zero and up to 10,000. It's a PQ histogram. It includes all the value of the PQ curve. Here, you have a representation of the image. It's distributed according to light intensity. That is what we call a heat map, which displays the light intensity according to the colors. Here are indicated the max full and the max yellow. As a reminder, the max yellow is the maximum content light level. It's the brightest pixel of the image. And the max full is the average luminance of the image. What we can see here? We can see here that on this extract from Ready Player One, there are some intensity, some light peaks, around 300 nits, and here we are around 515 nits. In terms of color volume, you have the representation of Rec709, it's the yellow triangle, and the DCI P3 is the green triangle, and the red triangle is the BT2020. In the first part, I showed you a color volume based on the CIE diagram of 1931. It turns out that there's another diagram that was released in 1976 which is more precise than the previous one. This diagram is represented like that, the horseshoe is a bit tilted. What we can see here is that the green exceeds widely Rec709. It even goes out of P3 to reach BT2020. We have a use of the HDR palette, which is rather interesting. Now, will all the TV will be able to reproduce this green? Not sure. But notice that for this shot, we have a pretty interesting HDR color volume. Here you can see that the large majority of the signal is between 10 and 500 nits. The signal doesn't exceed 337 nits. It's not very high values. The color volume just slightly exceeds the Rec709. Ready Player One, beyond the fact that this movie is absolutely awesome, it's a very pleasing to watch in HDR. But does it take advantage of what we can expect from an HDR image? I'm personally not convinced. Because honestly, between the SDR version and the HDR version, there is not much difference. I made comparison between the Blu-ray Full HD and the HDR. Yes, there are some more details in highlights, they are better transcribed. Once again, we are looking at the tone mapping version. On the majority of the shots, the difference is not extreme. It's also a special case because the majority of this movie is fully digital. Let's take a look at Joker. It's a really interesting case since it's a Dolby Vision color grading. 
which means that the SDR version results of the HDR version. This film is superb, the color grading is awesome, the light intensity are far from bringing extreme, but it's a very dark movie. The use of the color is awesome on Joker, as I said in my test. Really, colors are splendid on this film, but they're also quite restrained. Honestly, it's a movie that doesn't use all the potential palette of the HDR color palette. We are going to have a very beautiful image, very contrasted, but when we look at the color volume on this kind of image, it's very narrow. Typically, the signal representation is below 100 nits. Basically, from here to there, it's SDR signal. As soon as it is exceeded 100 nits, it's SDR. It's a shortened, simplified representation. But the SDR signal is between 0.001 and 100 nits. Any value above 100 nits, and we are in HDR. Theoretically, with the HDR, it can go up to 1000 to 10,000 nits. But your display system cannot reproduce all of this. So, when we look at the content HDR analyze, what do we see? On this shot, it goes down to 0.1 nits and it barely reaches 50 nits. And the color volume is not very representative of an HDR image. We are in the case where the HDR shouldn't be systematic. Some images get really enhanced by it, and some others just don't. There is no extreme peak light in this image. There is a small glint in his eye, that's all. All the rest is pretty flat. But it's not criticism, don't take it like that. The max ALL is at 467 nits. And does this amount make the difference with the SDR image? Only on the glint of his eye? I don't think so. Here there is higher light intensity because there is a lamp right behind him. But when we look at it, 90% of the signal is under 100 nits. It goes a little bit over here, but everything else is in SDR and it's the same for the color volume. When we are looking at the heat map, the majority of the image is between 0 and 10 nits. There is a bit above 500 here, but that's all. Here it's the same. 90% of the signal of the image is under 100 nits. There are some stronger light intensity over there on the lamp on the back, but it's only the lamp on the back. The highest value is under 600 nits. It's just right there. We have higher values during the riot scene. There is a dot here that reads more than 1000 nits, but it's really a small element in the image. It doesn't represent much. Once again, Joker is magnificent. In HDR, it's very impressive. Color management is great. We have a very contrasted image. But does it get the most out of HDR? I say no, definitively. Is there a major difference between the Full HD brewery and the 4K HDR brewery? No, not excessively. In fact, the SDR version is very close to the HDR due to the Dolby Vision trim pass. Michael Bay Transformers Fire. What can we say about a Michael Bay's movie except that there is an explosion in it? Here we have peak values above 1000 nits. In terms of color volume, not crazy. There is a little bit of petri out there, but in average, we are still in the Rex Evernight triangle. Where it gets interesting, it's on this image. Here, for once, there is a real difference between the HDR and the SDR. Even if there is a kind of bluish hue on HDR, we don't really know why, we start to see the details of the explosion that we don't have here. 
we have a lot of more information in the highlight in HDR version than in the SDR. We are around 700 minutes. For the rest of the movie, there is not fundamental difference between SDR edition and the HDR one. Now let's take a look at Alien. Alien has been remastered. The film has been rescanned. They made a 4K master and they made a new color grading. We have an HDR version which is absolutely magnificent. Nothing to say, it's magnificent. There is a big difference with the previous edition. There is a real improvement with the HDR edition. But is it due to HDR? I'm not sure. I think the interest of this edition lies in the color grading. Let's take a look at this picture. This is the full HD Blu-ray. And this is the 4K HDR Blu-ray. It's day and night. But is it due to HDR? This is the color grading, not more, not less. On a shot like that, typically, we have more details in black area. But just a little bit. It's less overexposed less greenish, here you can see that they calmed down the brilliance. Overall, they did something softer. For me, the gain is that they improved the blacks. They recover a bit of texture in the blacks. I suppose there were not much more texture on the film. I guess it was slightly underexposed. And there is not much more to see on this image between the SDR and HDR version. We have much more details, that's for sure. They calm down the highlights. The thing is with Alien, it's a very dark movie. There is no extreme light intensity in this film, and the color palette is pretty restrained. We cannot say it's a very colorful movie. Most of the color volume here is in Rex 9. On a shot like this, don't look at the color, it's almost monochrome. Here we can say that there is a gain due to HDR because the image will be less clogged and we are recover more details in the black area. Regarding the light peak, honestly, it can be 1700 or 100 nits. Here on these small dots, we don't see much of the difference. When we look at the heat map on this shot, we can see that 90% of the image is super dark. It's between 0 and 10 nits. Here on the slime and on some small parts of the jaw, we have light peaks above 1000 nits. Again on this shot, we can see that they calm down the color grading. We have less ketchup effect, it's much less theatrical. It definitely is a color grading that brings a new dimension to the movie. But it's a different color grading. Do they need it to do that in HDR? Not sure. The input of the HDR in case like that is new. I mean, it's not an image with extreme light intensity. I'm sorry, but it doesn't bring anything new in this dark area. We don't see more on the HDR pictures that we had on the SDR version. Only the color change. Even the light intensity are almost the same. Obviously, it will look better on a HDR TV set. It's undeniable. Because you're going to have a bit larger dynamic range, here we have a max ELL above 500 nits, but it's only on the teeth of the monster. Is it going to make any difference with the SDR version? When we look at the color volume, we cannot say that it takes advantage of what HDR can offer. We are right in the Rex 709 here. But again, it's not a colorful movie. Same on this shot. There is a big difference between the HDR version and the SDR, but this is color grading. It's more desaturated. It's darker. Yes, there are light intensity almost around 1000 nits, right there. But look at this, it's 3 pixels, it's peanuts, it's nothing in the image. Once again, I'm not saying that HDR of Alien is not good, I'm just saying that this movie don't take advantage of all what HDR can offer. Man Max Fury Roll, this is a very interesting case too. 
because there was a first edition which was released in Full HD Brewery from memory, I think it was in September 2015. And there was a second edition released in 4K HDR in March 2016. So pretty close in time. The color grading is quite different between those two editions. It's not the same treatment, it's not the same color management. On the 4K HDR version, we have to say that they pushed all the knobs full blast. Here you have the full HD version, and there you have the HDR one. Now the question is, why do we have such difference between those two versions? We have much more details in the HDR version. There are very high luminance peak. More than 2700 here, and here more than 4000. There are strong light intensity, and I think we can find even stronger, about 10,000. It's a very interesting case because we are right in the middle of the problem of the dynamic range between standard and extended. See this shot, we are on the full HD brewery. The sun is a bit like the shot I recorded previously, except that there it's even more pushed. There is the sun, so we have a big solid of color. There are not a lot of detail. And when we look at the 4K HDR edition, here what we have. You see? You see the difference? I can't understand how we can release an image like this in SDR in 2015 and release an image like that in HDR just six months later on a movie where the color grading process is fully digital. It leaves me puzzled. By the way, Mad Max is rather interesting because for all of you who thought that the HDR is necessarily much more saturated, a lot more colorful than SDR, this is the legal proof that it's not. Because when we compare the SDR version to the HDR, we can see that the SDR version is much more saturated. And the HDR is quite more neutral. When we look at the skin tones on this one, on the girl over there, you see that we have much less saturated and even the eyes, they lower it. We catch some details in the background. Again, don't take what I just showed you as face value. These are just extracts that came out of the context. It's not necessarily representative of all the artwork. What you have here in this picture is not representative of all Mad Max. Make up your own mind, buy this film, and don't forget, the artistic intention is more important than the light intensity or color volume or whatever. Now let's do a workshop about image size. We'll take a source which was filmed in 4.6K. We will export it in 4K UHD, 3840 by 2160, and it will be our reference. Then the same source will be exported in 2K, 2048 by 1152. Then I will export a 1280 by 720 version. We'll then import all of this in flame, and we will upscale all of this in 4K. Which means that I will take my 4K window and inside I will put my 2K and upscale it and also my 720p and upscale it. So everything will be in 4K and I will compare these images. You will see that there are differences, but they are not that huge. And especially today we have tools to erase this difference. Now we are in flame and here is the first component in 780p. There the component in 2K, and there the 4K UHD component. If I move everything here, where, as you can see, I have my 4K image, and here is my 2K image, and the 720p. So there you have the HDRD image displayed on my 4K screen. As you can see, it's a postage stamp. Here, you have the 2K on the 4K screen. It's the quarter of the image. And finally, you have the 4K which fills the whole thing. Let's upscale everything. Here, we're putting it in 4K. And we fill the image. Same here, let's copy that. We put it in 4K and we upscale. This is the 2K version. Now everything is at the same size. 
Here we have the 2K version, and this is the 4K version. Same as for the compression, I haven't moved, I have at 50 cm from my screen. So here we are looking at the 4K from the 4.6K, so basically we can say it's a native 4K. I'm looking at it and we can say it's a beautiful image, well defined. Now let's look at the 2K version upscale. Honestly, I don't see the difference. Mm. You really need to stuck on the screen to see the difference. Like if I zoom in the image, it's 150% here. Yes, now it's 300% and so obviously I feel there's something, but I'm sorry, when I'm at 100, I can't see any difference. It's unperceived. On the other hand, if I put the 720p version and compare to the 2K version, it's pretty clean. The upscale in 4K of the 720p is quite clean. Yes, I can see a difference, I'm not gonna lie. We can clearly see that it lacks some definition in the eyes. Now, two things. The upscale made by the flame is not the best there is. Typically, on DaVinci Resolve, you can find a way better quality upscale. And then you have treatment you can apply on the image to make it more defined, straighten the outline and more sharpness. There's a way to refine that and obtain a more defined result than that. Because honestly, the difference here is not that huge. But let's not lie, the difference exists. At least between the 720p and the native 4K, there is a difference. But between the 2K and the 4K native, honestly, uh, unless you stuck the eyes on the screen, you won't see it. If you are at 2 meters from new TV, I don't honestly think you can see it. Let's take a look at an app called Topaz Video Enhanced AI. At first, it's a general public application developed by Topaz Labs. But we sometimes use it in professional environment. Beware, I'm not telling you that we use it to make masters, upscale from cinema. No, I said that we make sometimes some VFX with it, time to time in commercial or feature film. But definitely, we don't use it to upscale a full master. Mainly because it's pretty greedy for an application. But the way it works, it's machine learning. And machine learning, we now have it in consumer devices. For example, the new shield. As an upscale, which is based on this type of artificial intelligence. Basically, how does it work? We have a software to which we gave images. These images they were reduced, then upscaled. And the big picture is compared to the original picture. And they develop algorithm to recreate the texture. By comparing the upscale image and the original one, we try to get as close as possible to the source. This is vulgarization I synthesized, but overall it's how it works. They did that with a lot of pictures, so they developed a kind of intelligent that is going to recognize the picture and try to upscale it and extrapolate, interpret how to recreate the texture. We are going to get a video, so in this case we will get my test in 720p. We are going to upscale it in 4K UHD. Knowing that I can go further, I can go up to 8K. We set the quality, the model of artificial intelligence and then I will export it at the best resolution possible, a TIFF sequence in 16 bits. The exported sequence will be very heavy. More than 74 gigas for 300 images. You remember, this is my 4K and this is my 720p. As you can see, it clearly lacks texture in the eyes. This is my Topaz Lab that I upscale in 4K. There is a small color shift, I don't know why there is that, but that's not too bad and we can fix it later. So take a look at that.
Can you see this? The texture, the detail I brought out in the eyes. Look at the hairs. Look at the groove on the wood. Let's compare with the native 4K. Yes, the color jump a bit, but in terms of definition and image quality, it's just crazy. It's simply amazing. This is the native 4K and this is the 720p. You can see that in terms of details, we are pretty far. Now let's display the Topaz version. It's amazing. Do you see the quality? It's bluffing. I have almost more details on the Topaz Labs than on the 4K native. Look here. Honestly, the upscale of the frame is not crazy. I love the frame, it's an amazing tool, but the upscale is not terrific. Here I did not touch the image, but I have ways to cheat. I can totally put a small filter on it. For example, this is the 2K that I upscale in 4K, on which I don't have a lot of details. I can apply a sharpen filter on it, and that's over. I have even more details in my 2K image with my filter than in my 4K native. I would like to take some time on this issue of Master 4K versus Master 2K, since this is something that comes up often among people who buy 4K Blu-ray and who feel cheated because originally the movie was in 2K and they are looking at an upscale on their Blu-ray 4K HDR. There is a lot to say about it, but notice that we cannot generalize because each film is a different case and each film follows a specific workflow, so it's quite complicated to draw generators. So let's take the problem backwards and try to explain how it works. What we call a digital intermediate is what it is. Originally, this term was used to name the process when we were shooting on film and had to scan some shots. We were making digital files out of them. At that time, it was logarithmic files in TPX 10 bit. The logarithmic is the curve that was applied on these files to be able to work on them and have some leeways in the high and low lights. Once we had to work on them, we were sending them back to the shoot, which means we were reshooting the digital file on film. It came from film, we're using a digital intermediate and goes back to film. Indeed, when you do that, you have to choose an image size. At first, when we were shooting in 35mm, the window was 2K. 20, 48, 15, 56. For 16 by 9, it was 20, 48 by 11, 52. It happened that we scan in 4K, but it was really rare. In those cases, it was 40, 96 by 33, 12, but again, quite exceptional. 90% of the time, when we were doing visual effects, it was in 2K. Then the workflow evolved. We had digital camera, we went to digital cinema, to DCI, so the image size changed. And mostly the camera started to record in totally different definition. No matter the workflow, no matter the way you're working, you will have to choose the size to work on. The size will have consequences, it will have an influence on the way you work, on cost, on a lot of things. Before the release of the 4K Blu-ray, we didn't ask ourselves the question, we were doing 2K because we are releasing DVD, 2K was good enough. Even when Blu-ray got released in 1080p, the 2K was enough. And even when we were sending the image back to shoot on 35mm, the 2K was still away enough. With the arrival of 4K HDR, we end up with 4K Master. Therefore, our old 2K Master, our former way of working, we are stuck because today we have a larger window than what we have before. Are we really stuck? Is this really a problem? We saw it, we are able to do high quality upscaling. You know that when you shot with a camera, you scan in 2K, but you have the possibility to scan in 4K. There is enough information on film print 35mm to scan in 4K. It's not a problem. So when you rescan an old movie from a film, 
you can release a 4K master with no problem. Where it gets more complicated, it's when the movie has been masterized in 2K and reshot on film or if there is only a master 2K. Then yes, you have to upscale. That being said, when they did this movie in 2K, maybe originally it was on film, so we have the texture. Maybe it was shot in 4K, then shrieked in 2K. You have the 4K information when it was recorded. When you're upscaling it again in 4K, it's not really a problem. It's the same when you're making a compression. At one time you have an image not compressed, then you compress it and decompress it at home. There is not any problem with that. Here it's exactly the same. Let's take a very simple example, Avengers Endgame. It's a 2K digital intermediate. Why? Because 3 hours of movie, 2500 VFX shots. Take a look at this shot. There are 40 actors on green screen, reconstructed areas, spaceships, aliens, superhero, armor, particle effect, practical effect, a lot of things. You have components everywhere, they're all made in 3D. They are made with several layers. If I show you this example, you see this car. The background was shot and they add this car in 3D. Thanks to Finn Jaeger for giving me this setup. As you can see, there is a layer for the car, a layer for the color, a layer for reflection, a layer for shadow, a layer for occlusion. There are plenty of layers just for this car and I don't even talk about the layer for the ray. You can easily end up with 15 layers just for this shot. So imagine a shot like that. There can be easily more than 200 layers. You need to work on this shot, you need to have the power to work on this shot, you need computers, servers to calculate this image. You need a colossal amount of resource for that kind of work. Very often the layers in 3D are calculated in 4K. But the compositing, when you will assemble these layers, the shots will be rendered in 2K. It's impossible to export a movie that huge in 4K. I mean, they have such a production deadline, such a amount of work, it, that's impossible because you have to understand that a shot like this, it's written transferred all the time, with a number of layers to manage, the number of elements that interact with each other, between technical department, artistic department, the director, the shot is not validated from the first time. So the amount of layers, the amount of return transfers, the amount of the shot, you're going under very fast. So what do we do? Everything in 4K and risk to crash the production? Or then 2K and upscale in 4K and deliver on time? The question doesn't even place itself. This is an example among many others. You have movies with 4K digital intermediate, movies where VFX are made in 4K, but probably with not the same amount of work. It's case by case. Avengers is one case, you have other movies entirely made in 4K. For example, you have Netflix productions that are done entirely in 4K from shooting to post-production. Once again, each case is different scenario. And notice that anyway, a large part of the heritage has been finalized in 2K and will always be in 2K. Today we can release 4K TV, even 8K TV, but movies won't be done again. Not every movie will be remastered in 4K HDR because it costs money and not all the studio can afford it. The catalog is just so huge, so you will have to deal with the upscale. Keep in mind that today the camera can offer you a way larger definition than 2K. Ari, Red and Co are able to record in 4, 5, 6, even 8K. There is even a new Blackmagic camera able to record in 12K. We have the matter. Even if we have to do a digital intermediate 2K, today we have the matter. Now for the movie that been masterized in 2000 in 2K, when the first digital camera, for sure, we have less matter. The sensors were smaller, the image size was 1080p. Sure, if you upscale it in 4K, you will not have the same quality that what we have today. That being said, I showed you a way of cheating. We know how to upscale an image. Again, the making of a Blu-ray 4K HDR from a 2K master is not a problem most of the time. We are going to make an HDR sequence. To get it, super easy. Just go on my website www.thelabodj.com. Click on the link for the sequence you are interested in. You have the choice between SDR, HDR10, HDR10+, Dolby Vision, HLG, Technicolor, SLHDR1 and 2. 
For each of these sequences, you will have a version 16 megabits and 50 megabits, the equivalent of what you can find on SVOD and 4K HDR Blu ray. To download this sequence, nothing easier, just click on the link you want, save it, copy the file to a new USB stick, and plug it on your TV. This way, you will be sure that the file will be decoded correctly. Obviously, subject to your TV being compatible, make sure the sequence you downloaded is compatible with your display system. To produce this sequence, I had to please everybody, and use the workflow which would satisfy both Dolby, HDR10+, HLG, and Technicolor SLHDR1 and 2. There was no way for me to do several files with different color of gradient, so I did the most complex and demanding workflow. And from that, I deliver the same file to everyone. Obviously, the most demanding workflow, guess who need it? Dolby Vision. For the Dolby Vision color grading, I went on DaVinci Resolve, on a workflow in 444, 12 bits, and full, with a simultaneous display on HDR screen and an SDR screen. To do the color grading, I had to find a HDR monitor. Theoretically, to be stamped Dolby Vision, I need a reference monitor, that is to say, a monitor that costs between 13 and 50,000 euros. Let me tell you that I couldn't find a toy like that. So I looked for an alternative solution, and I found the Asus monitor. Asus has a product range called ProArt. I've been put in touch with them, and they had the kindness to lend me a monitor for a considerable time. Sadly, now I have to reshoot, and I don't have the monitor anymore. But I did all the color grading of this sequence on this monitor. It's time for the product placement. I'm going to talk about the monitor Asus PA32 UCXK, and it's a little wonder. In order to be in the best possible condition, I had this screen calibrated. Calibration was done by Julien Berry, an ISF instructor. His contact details are written here. He's a very rigorous person. We calibrated this screen with a spectral radiometer and a tree stimulus with the tool from Kalman. And it was clear that the spec collected by his measure were very impressive. Light peaks were superior to 1500 nits, almost 95% of coverage of BT2020, and almost 100% of DCI-P3 and sRGB coverage. It's a very impressive screen, especially for that price. Of course, the screen is not considered as a reference monitor. It cannot hunt on the territory of a Sony X300 at 40,000 euros. The black are less deep and there are some blooming effects when a white solid move on the black background. Even if it's not a reference monitor, this device, for that price, it has just no equivalent, no competition. This screen is just magnificent. I'm not saying that because I have a partnership with Asus, they didn't let me the screen and they didn't ask me anything. I managed to convince Dolby to let me do the color grading on this screen even if it's not a reference monitor. I'm telling you, this device is superb. I could never have delivered this HDR sequence without this screen. And I even use it in production with the flame. On commercial, on Rex 709 for Guerlain and L'Oreal, and it went admirably well. That was product placement moment, and big thanks again for Asus team for letting me use this screen so long. Now I will show you the image I got and the way I organized myself to work on this sequence. First of all, I have some images provided by Olivier Chabodo from company Explorers. These images are in 8K. You can see here it's in 8192 by 4320. I strongly recommend you to go on explorers.com. This project is amazing. They set themselves a mission to draw up an inventory of the planet. You can find amazing content in 8K, 4K. There is an ecological project behind it. I really want to thank Olivier Chabodo and his team. First of all, for what they are doing and also for letting me use in these images. Please support this project, it's important, it's a really beautiful mission. Then I have shots from musical clips still on the run by the band Pool. I got this image by Freenjäger, a flame artist colleague who also do color grading. It's Biro from Blackmagic and 4608 by 2592. I have pretty interesting footage. Then also I have image from Evan Roya from Bokeh Production. Same, it's from Red, it's Air 3D in 5K. Then I have footage from a Mavic Pro 2. It was shot by a colleague, flame artist in Los Angeles, who just bought a drone. 
so he went to do some small tests and these images are rather interesting. It's not really log. Let's say it's a light log, but it makes good pictures. This shot will be particularly interesting because there is a real solid of color. You'll see that depending on your display system, you can have some small surprises, like a white solid or some clipping, because they are pretty intense light intensities. So it's going to be interesting to see how it behaves. Then there are some shots I recorded with my Z6. It's in Apple ProRes, I developed it in Scratch. I exported it in ProRes 444XQ. I did some correction in Flame because I shot this with the sliders. It's macro, so I'm really close to my subject, and obviously the slider shaking on this rail become an earthquake in macro. So there was some work for stabilize and a bit of cleaning. Once I finished the cosmetic surgery, I re-export from frame and went back on DaVinci. So I ended up in ProRes 444XQ, I added to the HDR sequence and did the color grading. I've got some images provided by Florian Friedrich. These images were already color graded in the HDR space, so I didn't need to do anything, I just added them to my timeline. There was no intervention on these images. Then I add some elements from iGrid.io. They came with different image size, recorded by different cameras like Red, Black Magic, like Sony. It goes from 6K to 2K. There are some shots in 2K upscale in 4K in these seconds, but I won't tell you what they are. There are different type of image in high quality. Here, for example, this shot is in L3D in 4.6K. We'll end this sequence with the images provided by David Coiffier. These images are absolutely stunning, and there's a proof that what we are looking for can be just next to us. I was looking for images in phantom in slow motion. I couldn't find it. I threw a bottle in the sea on Facebook and this guy answered. He lives at 3 kilometers from me. He's a DOP. He has his own phantom. He's been shooting from years and his images are absolutely astonishing. He kindly accepted me to use them from this sequence. So I end up with beautiful pictures. There is Paris during the lockdown. There are some wonderful slow motion shots like that. It's in Phantom Row, Cine Row, in 4K. There are some wonderful shots. I'll try to explain you briefly how it works without giving you a color grading class. In short, I have an element that I came out from camera. Like I showed you before, you need to label the clip. You need to test the software with what you're working with. Here it's a clip from RED, so I will debayer it. I indicate that the color science is IPP2 and this is red colored science. I associate it with the color volume red white cable and the EOTF log 3G10. You can see this shot is not displayed the right way, it's normal, you need to grade it. Here you have the oscilloscope, the representation of the video signal. Here the 1000 represents the 1000 bits. It's my limit I don't want to cross. Small detail, what you are seeing is a reshoot. I don't have the ASUS monitor anymore, ASUS took it back. So what you are looking at is a TV Panasonic. It allows me to show you something, but it's definitely not a color grading screen. I will then apply values to my signal, so here, I'll play with the contrast and the pivot, in a way to obtain a good quality signal. Here you can see that I'm going pretty low on my dark values, and I set my reads around 1000 nits. Now my image is displayed nearly correctly. That's the first step, to adjust the contrast. Then I add a small node where I'll adjust saturation. I also add a filter to take out the noise of the image. I use NIT Video. NIT is a really great plugin. I select a zone where I don't have too much texture in it, but I can see some grain. Then I analyze the image and apply the correction. I do it quickly. You can see the noise disappearing. What is amazing with NIT is that it removes the grain without burying the image. It's super impressive and super efficient. Here I did a basic setting totally lambda, just to be able to display it correctly. It goes from that to that. 
Once again, it's not a color grading screen. Here I have the signal representation. I don't exceed 1000 nits and I go down quite low. Here is the dynamic range, the highest value and the lowest one, in terms of light peaks and intensity. For the color information, here I have the P3 and you can see the P3 triangle. In terms of the green, we exceed widely the Rec709. But if I display the BT2020, you see we are not in it. Why? Because I limit to the P3. My EOTF curve is ST2084. I'm limited to 1000 nits and my color space is BT2020. I limit the gamut to the P3D65, so nothing will exceed it. Our TVs are not able to display all the totality of the BT2020, so I set the limit to P3. That's the way Netflix and Amazon Prime are working. At least in P3, we are almost sure that there will be no loss. I will do these steps on every shot of this sequence. I will debarriorize every shot that came from the red and from the black magic and other camera. Once the color grading is finished and we're satisfied of the result in HDR, we will launch the Dolby Vision analysis to analyze the whole sequence and we will do the setting for the trim. Here we will do a trim in SDR which means that from the HDR color grading, I will do a SDR version. I will apply settings to polish my color grading in SDR. Let me explain. If I'm satisfied of my color grading in HDR, once I look at my trim in SDR and I'm not happy with it, for example, if my sky is too burned here, I can polish this part here. I can set the highlights lower, so it will look less burned. If I think it's too saturated compared to my HDR setting, I can change the saturation, I can change the black level, I can operate on several options. And when I modify that, it doesn't change my HDR color grading. It's the interest of the trim, to adapt the SDR content to the HDR one. Here, we are talking about SDR content, but it could be something else. Dolby offers the possibility to do trim at 2000 nits, 1000 nits, 600 nits, and Rec 709. Which means that if I do my color grading on a monitor that can display 4000 nits, I did all my color grading with the limit set at 4000 nits, and I want to watch it on a TV that can only display 600 nits. Thanks to the Dolby metadata, I will do a trim, and I'll do some tone mapping to adapt this content to display it on a TV that can only display 600 nits. It's tone mapping. I can do tone mapping in 2000, 1000, 600 nits and Rec 709. Every time I'll set a specific intensity so the content can be as similar as possible to the final system. I have finished my color grading, I have finished my trim, now I have to do my exports. I will deliver my sequence and here I do two exports. I do one export in ProRes 444X2 for the people from Technicolor and Florian Fabrice. Florian will cut this ProRes and he will do his own analysis. He will produce dynamic metadata shot by shot and export an HDR10+. I will also send this content to Technicolor and Technicolor will do an encoding in SLHDR1 and he also editing shot by shot to produce dynamic metadata for the encoding in SLHDR2. For .b, I do an IMF. It's not really the same thing. I have a package with the image, the sound and the metadata. Everything will be incorporated in. If you want to see how Dolby Vision metadata looks like, I can export it directly in the IMF file or I can export it by itself. So here you can see I export the Dolby Vision metadata. It's a file, it's an XML file. So here is the metadata which contains all the information shot by shot of the sequence. Here you have the trim info, the trim I did earlier. This metadata will be read by your TV CMU. They will be decoded and allow the signal to be displayed super precisely. You will have all these versions available, you will be able to download them to make some tests on your setups. I highly recommend you to download the SDR version first and watch it before the HDR version. Be careful, your TVs when you add SDR version on it, they have tendency to boost to pimp the signal, so much that it gets hard to see the difference between the HDR and SDR. So beware of the pre-installed mode on your TVs. Look closely to the SDR version, 
before the HDR1. You still may have surprise. Depending on your settings, on the display capacity and your setups, it's possible that the HDR version offers you less detail than the SDR1. Let me explain. There are some images where the light intensity is very high. If your TV is poorly calibrated, if its capacity to do some tone mapping, some roll-off are not very precise, you can have clipped HDR image, which means you can have white clouds totally burned, totally white, and have no details in the highlights. And you end up with a SDR version that offers you more detail. It simply means that your TV is badly calibrated or it cannot display highlight correctly. It's not impossible. I'm not saying that it will happen, but you're not safe. I would like to spend some time to thank every people that joined this adventure. Firstly, the people that let me use their images. I'm thinking about Olivier Chabodeau from The Explorers and all his teams. About Pierre Joubert, with whom I made several road trips. These are absolutely sumptuous images, as you may see. I would like also to thank Finn Jagger, Miguel Mugliata Vasquez and Phil Gallas, and the band Pool, who gave me access to their music video footage. And let me color grade it like I wanted. I would like to thank Evan Rouillard from Bokeh Production, who gave me his red images that are just beautiful. Kule Bunker, who went to shooting for me with his Mavic. People from Artgrid.io, who provide me high quality content. And big thanks to David Coiffier for his totally awesome picture that he let me use. I would like to make a little dedication to David Coudizet, Thierry Pinoni, Marc Duré, and Benjamin Gigon. They were the first ones to trust me and gave me content. Sadly, I couldn't use them in the actual editing, so I wanted to thank them and wink. Now I would like to thank all the people who participated in the technical development of this project. Firstly, I thank the people from Dolby. They were the first to support this video and they helped me creating this content. Also, a big thank to Annelies Libolt, who was very present and did a lot of advertisement for the Labo de J. Big thanks to Michael Ackle and Jan Lowe, who let me use several times the Dolby license and who helped me control the content so that everything was okay. Now a big, a huge thanks to Benoit Leutener, with whom I shared and talked a lot. I spent a lot of time with him to be sure that the workflow was working, and also that the encoding were working. Benoit paid a lot of himself and invested himself a lot in this project. I really thank him a lot. Thanks to Florian Frederich from FH Pictures. He involved himself in this project a lot. He is an SDR expert and he develops his own tool. He is an official partner of HDR10+. He encoded this sequence in HDR10, HDR10+, and HLG. He acts as a quality control. I sent him all the content and he checked it for his own encoding, but also to be sure that everything will be fine for Dolby and Technicolor. He provided the tools I used to analyze the Blu-ray UHD. He provided me patterns, elements he recorded that I was able to include in my HDR sequences. His help was very precious and I would like to thank him from the bottom of my heart. I would like to thank the Technicolor team, Guy Ducos, Marie-Jean Colliettis, and Frédéric Plissonneau, who took care of the encoding in SLHDR 1 and 2. They believed in this project from the beginning, they support me and help me. I would like to thank greatly Michael Boissard, without whom I would never have made it. He was priceless help in the management of the workflow on DaVinci Resolve. Because believe me, making this sequence wasn't as easy as that. Mixing this footage from Nikon Z6, Phantom, Camera Red, Sony and Blackmagic. Not everything go along with the other. The managing of the HDR is not as easy as it seems. So big thank to him who allowed me to avoid a lot of traps. I would also like to thank Jean Cody and Olivier Mathieu who took a whole afternoon with Michael Boissard to dive into the workflow towards the traps I fall in. Thanks to them for their kindness and their patience. I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart Olivier Boissard from Samsung who opened a lot of doors to me, who introduced me to people from Asus and the Explorers. Olivier did a lot for this content. He was one of the first to believe in this project. Big thanks to Jean-Pierre Fournier from PostLogic. It's been 15 years that he follows me, helps me. I know that I can always count on him. Here he lent me some equipment. So big thanks to you and your team. 
thanks to Gérard Kabanak from Video Plus. He advised me, helped me, and was very present during the lockdown, even if it wasn't easy to get some equipment. So huge thanks to him. I would like to thank the ASUS team, Clément Yefon, Thomas Pro, and Kevin Melka, who were so patient. They were adorable, they lent me the monitor for a long time. Once again, this content would never have been possible without the land of this monitor. Thanks to Julien Berry, who accepted to come near during the lockdown, to spend hours with a mask on his face to calibrate the SDR and HDR monitor. Without him, this content won't have the quality it has today. I would like to thank the people from Nikon, Nicolas Gillet and Isham Bougaloun, who gave me access to the Apple ProResvo. I wanted to prove that we could do HDR content without a camera at 50,000 euros. Thanks to HD Land team, Christophe and Jack, for making advertisement to the Labo DJ and test the content that will be available. I would like to thank the shop Boulanger in Orgeval, who let me test full scale on several screens. The team was really kind and it was great to try on different brands this content. Same for Son and Video at Saint Germain en Laye. Thanks for your help and welcome. And finally, a small wink to Maze Aderold from Assimilate, who gave me a quick little training on Scratch. This video is now finished. I hope that you learned a lot and that you enjoy it. Don't hesitate to share it and subscribe to the channel. Go on the website and download these contents. Have fun and make some tests with them. Thanks to everyone for following me, for your message, for your support. Honestly, it's super nice, it goes straight to my heart. Thanks to everyone who participated near or far to this project. And take care of yourself, and I'll see you very soon.